Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today we had together to talk about uh, how to coordinate GBV in emergency from a practical point of view. So the moderated panel discussion today is on the GBV coordination handbook, which is the principal tool that all coordinators need to know. And I have invited today Farid Gul, the GBV subcluster coordinator for UNFP country office in Iraq and Verena Bruno, the GBV Working Group Coordinator in Zimbabwe uh, under UNFP uh, Country Office too. So this is Noemi, the GBV Regional Advisor for the GBV IOR, the team leader for Western Central Africa, sitting at UNFP Regional Office in Dakar. And I'm very pleased today to be here in Yola in Nigeria to introduce you this interesting discussion and moderate a conversation with one of the two coordination I appreciate the most. Farid is our coordinator in Iraq. He is among one of the most experienced coordinators of the GBV IOR. He has deployments in not only in Iraq, but also in the Caribbean, in Malawi, in Libya, and he is a national from Pakistan, where he started as GBV program analyst at the same month as GBV subclasser coordinator. So he's currently based in Iraq as GBV subclasser coordinator. Verena, on the other side, is the GBV technical specialist at UNFPA country office in Zimbabwe. That means that she's one of our famous double hatting coordinators. Um, her role includes the GBV coordination, but also GBV program management. She has experience in emergency in Eastern South Africa and in Latin America, where she supported climate change related and multi hazard GBV emergency response. I'm very glad that my colleagues in charge of regional coordinate, coordination for the GBV IOR have identified these two amazing colleagues today to serve as mentor, as inspiring people for our students in the class at the GBV in Emergency University course in Yala. So without taking too much time from, um, from, uh, from you today, I would like to go straight to the presentation, uh, not sorry, <laughs> to the introduction of what is the GBV coordination handbook and start with the question. Our coordination handbook has three uh, main parts that are important for us to, to, to know very well uh, and where all the work is structured around them. The first part of the coordination handbook is the frameworks for coordination. We have talked about concept of GBV coordination, core GBV concept, structure and policy, and the humanitarian architectures. These days during the course in YOLA, uh, you can find all the, all the knowledge you need in this first part of the handbook. Then you have the second part, which is about core functions. So this famous six core functions for cluster coordination, plus the implementation, tips and things to do for the implementation. Then we have the last part, which is about the resources for coordination. And this particular includes 8K interpersonal and managerial skills that a coordinator needs to build up to ensure effective coordination, but also this part contains additional resources and tools that you can use for meaningful coordination. So I have already introduced the panel. I have already introduced the handbook. I don't want to be so annoying. And I will look at Farid as first uh, responder of my first question. Uh, so if you can bring us directly to the implementation process, we know that a cluster coordinator needs to put in place a system that allows to perform the six core function. Just to wrap up, the six core functions are support, service delivery inform strategic decision making, planning and implementation of the GBV response, monitoring and evaluation of the GBV response, building national preparedness, and last but not least, supporting advocacy. So the question for Farid is how? How do you launch a group? How do you manage a group? How do you stimulate membership? Over to you. And thanks again to be here with us. 
Right. Thank you, Naomi, for the opportunity to be uh, here with you and uh, with that, our most amazing colleagues uh, with whom I'll be sharing this panel discussion. Um, the most important thing is that we are, we are here with our uh, students who are not only uh, here to learn from us, but we are equally here to learn from their experiences as well and also their thoughts uh, in any reflection. Uh, so it's very much bilateral, and it's not one-way traffic. Uh, um, in relation to the question that you ask, uh, the how aspects, uh, 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 know me. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll rather focus on um, the why and what and what if aspects as well, because that's that's very practical. It's not simply philosophical here. Um, look, I mean, the, in my context, uh, when I joined, as you mentioned as well, I, I joined as a program officer. And the same month I was asked, you know, if I could uh, lead the GBV subcluster because at that moment in time, there was uh, no national cluster coordinator and there were, we struggled to get the international colleague on board in Pakistan because of so many reasons. Uh, and so I said, okay, I'll, I'll try, I'll give it a try. Uh, the cluster in Pakistan then was there, but it wasn't there too. Uh, it wasn't there too in the sense that uh, it required a dedicated person to lead the cluster, but leading is not you as, as, as a lead. It's a collective ownership and leadership and initiative that you want to engage um, all members. Um, so what we did, was that uh, um, we engage uh, members from the civil society, which was lacking, academia that was lacking, a presence of uh, youth that was lacking, and uh, women-led organization that again, they were there, but they were not there. So how could you have voices um, of women-led organizations when as part of the decision-making, they're not seen? Um, and it was like heavily UN centric too. So, which is why the membership was about six, seven organization, primarily uh, uh, the lead agencies and its implementing partners. What we tried to do was to revise the TORs, revise the membership criteria, uh, include those groups that uh, I specifically mentioned. And um, to my surprise, in one of the meetings, uh, for example, I recall that how the language of some uh, professional were very biased uh, against, against the kind of work that you would expect them to do. So you, you are expected to uh, brace up with those kind of challenges and how, to, how you navigate those is another thing. When I said the now, coming back to the question of how, uh, when I said the why and what and what if uh, aspects are equally important or in fact more important is you have a population, for example, who is displaced or braced up with humongous humanitarian challenges. Uh, the trajectory of those we may never understand. We understand that they are survivors or we may conveniently call these victims of gender-based violence uh, is survivors, but survivor is a person I would imagine who survive. But in these cases, the trauma of the affected population and particularly acts of gender-based violence in certain cases of humongous, uh, brutal, um, uh, you see, types of gender-based violence, we cannot fathom, we cannot imagine their journey. And so how you see the journey, how you see the transition. And so when you talk about those aspects, uh, those six core aspects, you need resources. So why you need resources? You need resources to have improved GBV programming. Uh, you, you need resources to have um, quality access of survivors of gender-based violence to those services. Access remains major issues in most cases, Naomi. I'm sure other colleagues would agree with that as well. Um, not only because 
there, there could be potentially certain services that may, might not be available, but also because gender-based violence or certain forms of gender-based violence, which are quite prevalent in a social, uh, you know, particular social uh, context, could be considered quite normal, quite acceptable. So how you mobilize those is as well. Um, so that aspect is, 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 is very, very important. The other in relation to uh, supporting service delivery, uh, I would imagine that uh, we as a cluster, once you have the cluster or working groups or the sector in operation, you would imagine that there is an effective um, uh, and regular service mapping and referral pathways so that when you refer a survivors to X organization, the X organization have certain level of presence in, in, in that certain locality. And your organization have a system in place to ensure that there is follow-up system as well. Now, informing about strategic decision-making is so critical because clusters coordinator or sector coordinator, GBB coordinator are expected to influence decision makers um, in one way or the other. They could be the ICCG, they could be the HCT, they could be any other humanitarian coordination forum which is led or co-led by even government entities. And these government entities in certain cases could be reluctantly engaged. So just wanted to alert you on that. Um, or in certain cases, they, are, they have their own apprehensions about your engagement. So you need to have tip sheets, you need to have fact sheets about those key aspects, why these services are important, um, and what is it that you are going to do. And then what if those, those, those issues are not addressed, like the consequences, what's going to happen? Planning and implementation is such, you know, that it's a, it's a joint collaboration. It's not the sector coordinator or the working group coordinator job alone. There are many stakeholders which are part of it. Um, your, your needs assessments informed by humanitarian, humanitarian needs overview exercises that you may conduct alone or sometime through multi-clusters, multi-sectors, needs assessments or through secondary data that you may gather or any uh, data that you gather from census or uh, whatever uh, that you think is reliable and most contextual and uh, recent um, that could inform your, your planning and implementation process or processes as well. Monitoring and evaluation because whatever you envision as part of your planning and implementation, you monitor you monitor and see uh, if the services that you provide or your organization that they are providing or sector members they, they promise to provide is, provides have the quality uh, that could address issues of gender-based violence. Um, building national preparedness and supporting advocacy. It's one of the most important aspects of our work or your work. I'm, I'm sure tomorrow you will be uh, someone who will, you know, hopefully replace us or uh, will get the opportunity to work with us. So investing in national preparedness and supporting advocacy. You can't remain in this, uh, you know, in a humanitarian bubble forever for, for, for that long. So it's important that the, the moment that you um, envision those, those, those key aspects of the work, you also start planning about um, a transition, a transition from the urgent immediate life-saving needs to towards recovery and rehabilitation and stabilization and perhaps long-term development. And so there is a transition plan in place. There is a plan which, is, which demands a durable solution uh, related tools are ready and the government partners, the local organization partners are ready uh, to to own your work. I mean, when I say own our work, it's important. It's important because there is a, this level of leadership and initiative and investment in their ownership that you made, and so that they continue and the work that we do in addressing gender-based violence uh, remains there on the ground with with 
with, with a good level of capacity and understanding and how those understanding and skills that they learn and the investment that you make in those key areas is translated into their work. So uh, I hope I, I answer uh, your question, uh, Nomi. Yeah, you did. It's a conversation. Yeah, well, I think that you gave some tips, but I think that you can also add more because, for example, you mm -hmm. talk about the tip sheet and the fact sheet, you know, that you, uh, you are using to persuade, to give arguments yeah. to why you need to put in place services, why you need to have a performing referral pathway and so on. So in particular, when we have, you have a resistance. But to be very practical, Farid, when you are opening up a coordination, what are you doing? Well, the expected, you know, I, I, right, okay. Um, I, look, I was in Malawi a few years ago, and there was this lady who uh, who shared very amazing experience and uh, uh, this saying, which is very much, you know, uh, in vogue in, in, in Africa. And she said it in here in Africa, they say that when you want to run fast, run on your own, but if you want to run together and if you want to run far, run together. And I think running together is the essence. Um, and with that in mind, I mean, I'll give you one particular example, uh, not very far, I mean, this, this, this week as well, where we wanted to have uh, engagement with the uh, livelihood emergency cluster. And so this cluster coordinator was asking me, Farid, it's your work, because you have included livelihood uh, intervention is part of your HRP and those interventions have already started implementing and now mainstreaming and integration as per our livelihood emergency HPC cycle is something that you know uh, uh, is, 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 you know, is your headache, is not a headache. Um, but you have to make them realize, you know, that it's a collective responsibility, a shared responsibility. Mainstreaming integration is something that is by the Interagency Standing Committee Guidelines of 2015, all lead uh, UN agencies of the clusters have promised to mitigate and risk this, uh, and exposure to essential actions at the minimum. Uh, the other thing is that uh, what you are expecting from these emergency livelihood cluster in this particular case is to come up with a joint action plan of the GBB subcluster and the livelihood cluster. In any case, uh, your priorities meet with their priorities too, because a huge caseload, for example, is, is women and adolescent girls for them too. So you find areas of you know, commonalities in how you intervene and find a window opportunity to uh, engage them in working. So here, um, Iraq is going to be one of those countries in the region where um, for the first time, we will have uh, integrated uh, cash assistance, but also um, emergency livelihood related interventions, creating space for uh, income generating opportunities, lively, um, livelihood intervention, also to improve the socioeconomic standing of survivors of gender based violence. Because at the end of the day, I mean, um, you know, uh, those specialized standardized approaches doesn't necessarily work in every context so it's like what is it that survivors of gender-based violence which we call like survivors fight far too conveniently i mean uh, this takes a time and long interventions in certain cases the trauma may continue for far too long with victims of gender-based violence if effective mechanism is not put in place i'm a covid survivor for example uh, now me because i survived one of my friends died uh, three weeks ago, he couldn't. So he is a victim. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we cannot understand the, the trajectory of this journey or their journey. It's conveniently far too easy uh, for us to understand or say that we understand. Uh, that's not the case. So I think you need to have that empathetic understanding in trying to persuade with that lens and engage those clusters partners. We are, we are very lucky and uh, uh, highly successful in the case that we have cash working group uh, working with us as part of this joint uh, initiative, emergency livelihood and food security and agriculture. So it's, it goes beyond, it goes beyond 
risk mitigation and uh, mainstreaming and integrating uh, interagency standing committee guideline is per their um, uh, HPC. So it's like integrated response. So that it's not what Farid thinks is important, but what the affected population thinks is important. And for that, we have the data. We have the data collected um, last year um, from from various assessment. GBV subclusters one of was one of the uh, uh, subclusters or clusters in Iraq who conducted um, the highest number of assessment last year. And so, what do you do with those assessments? Those assessments should inform the interventions. And the GBVIMS data that uh, we we collected and we analyzed of 2020, for example, Naomi, uh, and its comparison with the previous years of 2019 and 18, because the GBVIMS data is the data that, you know, based on cases reported by survivors of someone on their behalf. And when it comes to service provision, those three uh, were the most critical services uh, requested and required by by the survivors of gender-based violence, cash assistance, emergency livelihood, and legal support. In the uh, cultural context or country, you know, legal framework, which is a big hindrance, particularly the legal assistance and support. But those have been integrated into uh, RHRP for 2021. And moving forward, what we are trying to do, particularly with that emergency livelihood-related intervention, create job opportunities, job placement, um, you know, startups, uh, economic incubation and those kind of opportunities, uh, market access. So these are the areas where we are also trying to engage corporate sectors beyond like a humanitarian aid workers and development uh, sector aid workers. So that's how we see it. Yeah, and that that's very interesting as a practice because um, because you talk you talk about a lot of concepts that we have actually in the first uh, chapter of the two yeah. chapter actually of the coordination handbook because you link it with the importance of concepts. So all GBV coordinators really link to have this awareness on the core concepts. The speech mm -hmm. about Farid, which is emotional uh, uh, between the difference of survivor and victim, is something which is awareness of the coordinator yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's very very interesting and you insisted a lot on the membership and the collaborative leadership which, which is also your role but is also the role of the members so right, this part same. yeah this part everyone can find like more elements on the coordination handbook but yes. the example that farid give on gbv integration is very innovative also uh, because it's we tend to uh, focus on life-saving activity, which is okay to coordinate. But Farid say that in its operation in Iraq, they discovered that the most requested services were cash, livelihoods, and legal, which are not traditional GBV intervention. No. And that needs work with other clusters because maybe the comparative advantages is not around your table. You are coordinating actors who have not this comparative advantage. The people who are the best doing that are sitting at the food, uh, like uh, food security, are sitting at cash working group, are sitting at livelihoods working group that maybe you don't even have in Nigeria. But that's, that's the situation. So a good coordinator needs to scan that. And what Farid explained to us, it's the last part of um, is the how to integrate GBV, which is one of the biggest work of a coordinator in other sector but you can also we didn't we, we can't talk about everything on the coordination handbook but on the part of the implementation the um, uh, you can also find like how to develop a term of preference what should you do the first week of an emergency if there is an atlar disaster and you go and so on. so thank you uh, farid that was very interesting uh, Pleasure. And now I, sw I switch to Verena because uh, uh, the, the majority of our discussion today is on soft skill. Uh, and Farid already talked a little bit about soft skill. He explained already something which is normal when you talk about uh, coordinating because it's with this soft skill that you make the coordination uh, working. So for you, Verena, which is the most effective way of coordinating a GBV 
subclasses. So using the collaborative leadership that Farid has already mentioned it, and as show as you mean i don't want that we tick the box of having meetings we need to explain how not to be a coordinator who's only organizing a meeting each month having people chatting together and that's over the coordination is done okay thank you so much uh noemi and thank you farid for the for the highlights um i'm gonna switch my video off in a minute because the network might not last but first of all thank you so much for inviting me it's great to be in nigeria today and it's great to know all the future gbv coordinators can you raise your hands i can see the benches but i can't see the hands yay <laughs> okay so um noemi you're very right um we need to know the technical skills but we also need to know um the soft skills which at the end of the day um, is what really makes coordination more effective. So I'm going to share a little bit of what I think is the most effective way. Um, so I think, as Farid already mentioned, um, understanding the context and adapting coordination styles to me is really important. Um, I know you are already all familiar with the different styles we talk about um, um prescriptive delegative or participatory styles for coordination but to me is really about how um, and what is it that the stakeholders in a particular country are strong about and whatnot so from there um it will be easier to apply the different styles um also by avoiding either intimidating <laughs> the partners um for instance if you're too delegative and they have no clue what what you're talking about or even annoying them, and this can also happen in countries, for instance, um, where um, there is a very strong capacity, for instance, including from the government, and um, um, in some countries where I worked, the government is also the co-chair of the subcluster, um, and you really need to um, find the balance on between uh, providing your, your technical support as coordinator, but also leveraging on the very strong capacity that you can actually meet on the on the ground um, in some countries for instance some ngos are more used to development and all of a sudden they're asked to, to do emergency response in that case you need to adjust you know how you coordinate and support them accordingly as well um, open coordination is um, is very important uh, open, open communication is is very important um, and um, again to me it's important to to really have everybody understand that coordinators are not there to teach the job right or to prescribe anything um, everybody is an expert uh, within within the GBV subcluster they might be experts on some particular service delivery models they might be experts on disability mainstreaming um, but you really need to pass the message um, that we are all there to build together um, the response to GBV in emergencies, um, be it a humanitarian response plan, be it um, an assessment tool. Um, you really need to pass the message that it needs to be um, everybody's um, expertise um, joined, right? And being approachable um, and creative, that positive vibe to me really worked wonders because as Farid already mentioned, GBV is sensitive and there will be cases where there will be conflict, there will be no, um, everybody on the same page about data and about what is life saving. Um, but if you are approachable and you create that positive vibe, it will be easier for the, for the, for the members, for the partners to also share their concerns. Um, in Zimbabwe, recently we had an instance. So Zimbabwe has been in lockdown since March 2020 because of COVID. It's one of the countries in Africa um, with more severe lockdown national measures. And of course, we worked with the government to have GBV services recognized among essential services. But still, we had an issue with um, community workers and the partners that were managing those um, they were facing mobility challenges. Um, if we had not been approachable and have that positive vibe and understanding also with the government, probably those partners would not feel comfortable to share the issue. 
But luckily, uh, because we were a very approachable <laughs> subcluster team, um, the ministry was very supportive and we eventually managed to include also the community workers and the partners managing them as essential services because they did play a critical role um, at the referral level, right? Um, now, in the last few years, but in general, in all emergencies, um, communication is also about a good dose of innovation. Um, because either you are running around as a headless chicken in the field and you can't see it on your laptop, or on the other side, as in the COVID context, um, you can't actually do physical meetings. So um, it's really important to find alternative ways of communicating. Um, in my operation, um, we use WhatsApp groups a lot. Um, so you can assess if there is good connectivity and, and set up this type of meeting, I mean, um, WhatsApp chats. Um, and um, also, for instance, we created shared folders, uh, which also worked wonders in the COVID response, where it's not only the coordinator uploading all the products, but it's everybody from their own um, area of expertise um, uploading products, ISC messaging, tools, reports. So everybody really feels responsible of something, right? It's not everybody just waiting for the coordinator to upload stuff in the folder. Um, so soft skills also <laughs> include, um, and Noemi, you mentioned it, um, is not only about setting up meetings and ticking the box, is really how, how effective and interactive the meetings are, right? Um, so again, I think in Zimbabwe, there is a very good understanding um, that meetings are not the coordinator coming up with the agenda and sharing it with everyone, but is the partners proposing um, topics or issues that they need um, the team to discuss. And so we build the agenda together. Um, and um, it's about diversifying the discussion. And if we want to really go in the simple things, um, even just hearing the voice of the coordinator all the time can become really boring. So it is really important that all partners are main actors, even in the way we, we organize meetings and we conduct meetings. Um, and they can facilitate some, some parts of the meetings um, so that it, it is really interactive across. Um, Again, in the era of COVID and all meetings being virtual, um, we also need to be very careful with the concept of time, which has also changed. And remember, for instance, that, okay, we might have to attend the coordination meeting twice a month or once a month, but still we are requested to run in the field. So it is important to understand that not everybody might have the same access to connectivity um, or the same time to attend the meeting. So um, it's good to give enough time to everyone for their feedback, um, even if they're not able to attend the meeting. So this is something um, that we have learned once again during the COVID, um, the COVID response, so that even if the partners are in the field, they can still provide their inputs and feel engaged. And we make them feel like their inputs are important, right? Um, and then maybe last point, which I was thinking about um, just a few days ago, uh, talking with another coordinator from another cluster. Um, it's about managing frustration. Um, and it often happens uh, because GBV, unfortunately, as part of the protection cluster is usually or most, most of the time the most underfunded cluster. So as much as we can engage partners in coordinating and um, you know, making sure everybody's linked to everybody, the referral pathways, um, there is that, that limitation of funding that makes the partner say, okay, but now what? We don't have the funding to do what we've been planning for. So to me, again, coordination um, is not only about, you know, um, Make, making sure the services are in place and reaching population, of course, that's our main, main objective to, you know, to save lives and to protect those that are affected by GBV. But it's about building the skills of all the, the partners in the cluster um, in their respective districts and provinces. So, for instance, in, in Zimbabwe, 
um, we don't really have um, coordination structure at sub-national level, but we have built a pool of trainers from all the partners that lead capacity building efforts in the different districts um, and assist the Ministry of Women Affairs with this. Um, similarly, we have identified rapid assessment, um, rapid deployment focal points from all the partners. So they actually lead directly um, the, the intersectoral assessment teams in integrating GBV analysis. So they are all over also in, in you know, supporting the other clusters with the mainstreaming, which Farid also mentioned is, is a very important aspect of, of coordinating GBV. So we are soon going to do the same with preparedness. We are supporting the Department of Civil Protection, which is the, the main entity for a humanitarian response, especially to climate change cyclones. Um, so just a few examples to say um, this is a way of not just in, just ticking the box for the for the meeting, but having partners feel engaged, feel um, they have expertise that they can always contribute to, and this makes um, uh, makes coordinating the GBV subcluster more effective beyond the core functions and beyond all the technicalities. So I think maybe this this few points, Noemi, to start with. Over to you. But I think that this is a very interesting conversation because, first of all, I've learned that uh, I could use or I could advise all other coordinators to use the trainers and the pool of trainers to be like a small GBV subcluster in the field. That's that's a brilliant idea, actually, in particular for countries that work on um, fragile uh, climate situations, so they need to step up and create new groups from nothing all the time. So that, that's actually a very good uh, tips. And I like also your, your, um, your reasoning about building the skills tool, um, not only to coordinate the response, but this part of, of the work. Um, and I think that also the advocacy outcome of the community and uh, the community workers, the, the community-based organization who are key for the referral pathway that are considered essential services, that, that's great also as advocacy. So these three examples are really an example of how you use your soft, soft skills and your technical knowledge to adapt to a country needs, to the situation, to the to what the women and girls are asking you uh, in the field. So that's actually very practical and uh, very informative. So Farid, I was thinking that Verena talked to, uh, talk to us mostly about effective communication, about mm. uh, how to foster the collaboration and how to manage the meeting. Um, but it's not always so easy. So you okay. can have situation uh, or simple things like just changing a meeting day uh, that can create an issue and having people that are not available are creating a, like a situation where there are tensions or you can have different potential outcomes where you are, plan you are in planning something mm -hmm. for your GBV subcluster and uh, a joint work you need, you need to focus people around that and people want different outcomes from the same thing they were supposed to do together and it's difficult to find a common uh, common area of interest yeah. so i would that you help us in this part of the difficult conversation yeah. about uh, we have three competencies that we want to learn and to build when you and we are when we become coordinators and they are nego negotiation, managing conflict, and building consensus. So I over to you. For this. Thank you very much. Or it's, uh, that's, that's a very interesting uh, example that you mentioned. You know, as simple issues like changing a meeting uh, to, to very complex issues such as like, you know, community engagement and uh, their apprehensions or the government stakeholders and how they see you. You see, uh, I remember, um, this particular uh, case in Pakistan, where uh, uh, the community, uh, the traditional community leaders uh, ask the IP to stop the operation, the implementation and everything, and close the work. And the reason was uh, that 
the dignity kits, it entailed, you know, certain content that uh, to them, to the cultural context, they were objectionable. Uh, so there is a risk of, a, uh, you know, closing down the women-friendly spaces in other, and so, so what do you do then? And again, like, you know, how you engage the community members in the decision-making, consultation, and ensure inclusivity in the work that you do as well. Those, those are key important. Um, I, 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 in that particular instant, I received a call from the IPs and I was asked to come because somehow, you know, I not necessarily come from the same region, but another tribal region bordering with Afghanistan. So that cultural appropriateness comes into play and in cultural understanding and how you see the community people and uh, see different stakeholders. I said to our uh, international colleagues, you know, let me just go and meet, uh, meet, meet the persons. I went to the traditional leader who was, uh, who was head of the tribe. I sat on the floor with him. I said it, he asked me if I want tea or, you know, water. I said it both. Uh, because it's part of the culture, if you don't drink tea or the water that they offer, again, uh, it's considered uh, very disrespectful. So culturally appropriateness comes into play as well. I said both. And then we talked about different issues. He touched base on the contents of dignity kits and why the the community people see that it's a it's something which is very Western. Uh, they are they are they're kind of uh, intruding into the cultural you know context and trying to derail you know the community in a in a certain way. I ask about other problems that the community uh, are facing. The gentleman had to say that uh, uh, there is no gynecologist in, you know, in in in, in this setting uh, because um, gynecologists uh, are reluctant to come from the settled areas such as Peshawar and those vicinities, um, you know, to come to those those tribal areas which are far remote and far and there are so many other challenges as well. And I, I so ask out of uh, my curiosity that, you know, how you see the girls' education then? If you're not going to uh, promote, if you're not going to encourage your girls to go to school, how are they going to become doctors, engineers, teachers, and, and be there for you, for your community? How are you going to do that? And, uh, the gentleman said that that's a good question. I said, of course, it's a good question, but you know, I mean, don't don't see us as as someone who are there to change your culture. Culture is a beautiful thing. There are, however, you know, certain harmful traditional practices which are inhumane, which has negative implications for, for example, for young girls and women, and because of those, they cannot achieve what you want to achieve. Or they want to achieve and so he asked me what shall what do you expect from us and i said it look i mean you have objections around these dignity kits and certain intervention would it be possible if the community uh, members both men and women and young people as well we set up a project committees so that whatever we do you are you are part of the uh, decision making and uh, you guide us as well from time to time because what works in one country, in one region, may not necessarily work in the other. So that's how, you know, you shift from best practices at the time to make it like, you know, fit practices that strategically uh, respond to the, uh, the consequences of gender-based violence. That happened, and um, what happened was quite interesting because that project ended and the community members wanted the project to be continued because there were certain aspects uh, of the projects which the community uh, people wanted to continue. So we had to reach out to the donor and say, hey, the community members want the project to be continued. That happened too, and after that ended too, the community members, because of the project committees and uh, the existing system that we had around that time, they continued the, the work that uh, we intended to do together with them, community awareness, uh, mobilization, um, you see sensitization, advocacy on those those issues that remains very pivotal to 
addressing gender-based violence. So it's, it's, it requires a kind of a very systematic approach, but talking about those negotiation and decision-making and conflict-related skills that you mentioned are something that you need to have, you know, basic understanding of us as human. That is the first, you know, foremost important aspects. We are working with machines like, you know, you and colleagues in Nigeria and, and, and Verena, we are, we are connected through this machine, uh, you know, and technology. But at the end of the day, we are working with people. So one of the most intrinsic skills that I would, I would, I would imagine that a GBV coordinators or program coordinator should have, you know, is, is, is that empathetic understanding of us as human and to get to know um, the story of these people who go through this much. Because that's important. I give you one another example. Uh, uh, we had this uh, government uh, counterparts and there was a reluctant engagement from their side as well. Uh, issue access to that particular region was, was, a, was a big issue. So we tried to engage them and we uh, organized a training in which government counterparts were involved. There wasn't one particular exercise, uh, Naomi, in which there were, you know, participant training, training participants were playing different roles. And so by in very intention, we gave this role to this government uh, counterpart where this person was a, uh, was a rape victim. And uh, so when the role play started, right, in, in the cold winter of Peshawar, he started sweating. He started sweating. Nobody re realized, you know, that it was me because I intentionally gave the role play. And one other co-facilitator, and he started sweating. And uh, when it, it began and like uh, the, the process or processes, you know, that were involved in how a case is referred from one point to the other, or the, the very attitude and behavior of different stakeholders, sometimes from the very family members, the very loved ones, and the social exclusion and neglect and isolation and, you know, that, and the trauma that um, a survivor may face, uh, he had to accept that, you know, I, I never went through this, but it's just an experience that I went through when he was having this session to debrief and he said, now I realize how tough it might be for a, for a rape victim. This is what you know we need to do. So people-centered, we need to be people-centered. We need to have the empathetic understanding uh, to be the voice for the voiceless and provide that enabling and empowering environment where they could experience. And again, you know, that continuum from being a victim to survivor. Uh, and, and contribute positively. So that should be, I mean, um, if, if and, and these are the skills, by the way, I mean, one can easily learn as well. Um, that, that's not something that we can't develop. Um, and the kind of work that you do, we all do, I mean, you may please certain counterparts while uh, you're risking some to become apprehensive about your work as well. But how you navigate is, is 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 most important thing as well. It reminds me one example as well. There was this. Uh, I do not know if, if colleagues in Nigeria is familiar with this uh, this person called Mullah Nasruddin. Mullah Nasruddin was a character um, in the Central Asian fables and jokes and stories as well. He would depict himself as a very silly character, but in those characters there was always wisdom. And in one of the stories, for example, he is seen uh, in the night, under the moonlight, seeing for some lost items. So there is this guy like, you know, Verena or Naomi comes in and asks, Mullah, Mullah, what are you searching for? And he says it, uh, I'm searching for my lost keys. And uh, so Naomi asks, so where have you lost those? And he says that it's inside my house. And so, if she asked that, uh, why are you searching it here then? He responds that because I've, because there is A, uh, the door is locked, and B, there is darkness inside the house as well. The moral of the story is very simple to me. I think it's, we need to understand. We need to understand A, um, 
you see how it could be. And again, this, 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 this understanding and realization, what if we are not there to provide that kind of enabling and empowering. Um, and, and, you know, from my experience, we have been very successful. When your heart is at the right place um, and it's filled with, uh, you know, with those intrinsic human-centered skills, I mean, you, you, you easily navigate your, your way and find your way towards an environment where your enemies could become your counterparts and, uh, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll take ownership and leadership and, uh, of the work that you would do. Thank you, Farida. Well, about that, you make me thinking about a training I did with the militaries ages ago when I was so young. <laughs> and and uh, can you imagine how this kind of tool that you use in training, those this scenario based, like to have role plays and so on, can you imagine to have everyone playing the role among the military, so the survival, yeah, yeah. assisting the survival, so on. Can you imagine how much the masculinity was challenged? So the idea, the traditional idea, and it was heartbreaking when we did the post-mortem at the end of exercise, how Can much imagine, yeah. these strong men were sharing and were like uh, discussing with us and uh, challenging also the patriarchy, the, the, the talking feminist, you know? Because they yet felt something, and they they are thinking about their sister, their daughters, their wife, and and how they really can be better serving the communities they they serve. Absolutely. Anyway, I totally agree with you that uh, one of the most important things to coordinate such a sensitive sector as GBV is to have a big art, but because it's difficult if you don't at least try to have this good this big art. So thank you very much. Um, I have a very last question for Verena now, uh, which is linking to two specific aspects uh, of our work. One is the accountability that we need to have, um, that we need to have always um, in relation with the, the people we serve, in relation with the humanitarian actors, in relation with the donors that give the money and so on. And the other is about staff, staff care. We just talk about how heavy can be uh, the GBV work. And uh, we know that we have been quite bad in the past in uh, dealing with uh, the trauma that the people who work on the GBV response can also experience a secondary trauma or as just stress of a field operation and we are starting to invest more. So before, because of your experience, because of your interpretation of the things, what do you want to say to us about accountability and about staff care, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, once again, um, Noemi, and thanks Farid for the very interesting um, examples from the field. I agree that um, they were really useful and yes, we need to have a big heart to be GBV, um, GBV actors. So yes, accountability and um, care for staff and staff well-being. So I'll start with accountability, maybe and give a, a few examples on what I, I picked from, from my experience. Um, so accountability is a very critical topic for all clusters, um, but for GBV um, partners, I think um, we have sort of an additional responsibility because of the work that, that we deal with on a daily basis, um, and in particular accountability to beneficiaries, uh, which as, as we mentioned many times, um, they are already going through trauma, right? Um, so I think um, one important point is about um, how you engage beneficiaries at project design level. This is critical because we as experts, we usually, we have a bit of a tendency, even if it's not fully recognized, um, to sit on our laptops and craft projects based on our experience. Um, it is critical to engage beneficiaries, the women and girls on the ground, but also men and boys, so that uh, whatever we come up with is um, what they really need, not what we think they need. This to me is a very simple way of 
uh, being accountable to them and working for what they need. Um, another point that I was thinking of yesterday when I was uh, going through of uh, this, this discussion that we were going to have is about data. And again, GBV and data is another very burning um, topic of which you might be um, familiar with. Um, sometimes it's a tough job, but I think being accountable as a GBV coordinator also means um, ensuring that data are accessible and having the guts to question data that are not really making sense, right? Um, just the other day, um, in Zimbabwe, we're now going through a um, humanitarian response plan review uh, mid-year. Um, but one of this, the, um, the reports that we were um, going to work with didn't really have data on GBV that made sense to me. They were not matching with any other source of information that we had. So just to say that sometimes being accountable is also fighting back on something that is not really making sense for what you know. Um, accountability is about um, ensuring that, there, that the beneficiaries have the chance to complain if there is anything to complain about, the famous complaint mechanisms. This is another very basic, uh, basic one. Um, and in this um, recent years, we look more and more specifically also, not only at complaining about how a program um, is really delivering to them, but also remember the PSEA part, the protection from sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, and being accountable um, as a coordinator um, and or as uh, you know, part of a GBV subcluster is ensuring that all these basics are included in the TORs, for instance, that are recognized across the board in a more formal way, right? Um, how do we enhance accountability? Um, there are different platforms in different countries. In Zimbabwe, for instance, there is what we call um, AAP, Technical Working Group, Accountability to Affected Population. So a, a good practice is to have focal points, and we have focal points from the GBV subcluster that really lead, and it goes back to the capacity of all partners. They lead whatever we do in terms of accountability to affected population. Um, they develop tools, they develop complaint mechanisms, and then they, they cascade to the partners, right? And they make sure that the, the accountability is strengthened, um, not only talking about it at the national level, but also um, down at the field level. Um, we also have um, focal points for PSCA, uh, and this was done in Zimbabwe recently with the support of a dedicated PSCA advisor from the from the resident coordinator's office. Um, and again, having focal points might seem as a very simple thing to do, but it makes the difference to lead, you know, and to make sure that simple processes don't follow, don't fall through the cracks. Um, so just, just a few examples on, on accountability. Um, now going to the uh, care for the carer. Uh, we, we talk about caring for the carer and Noemi, you're very right. We sometimes tend to forget that we are there to help others, but sometimes we also need help ourselves. Um, and this can be for various reasons, right? Um, because of the increased workload, and again, COVID-19 was a very bad example or good example of how our workload has increased in the last year and a half, um, and the stress that comes with that. Uh, but also because besides being GBV actors, um, sometimes we might actually be um, victims of the same emergency that we are working on, or worse, we might be GBV survivors ourselves. Um, so um, we can look at how to prevent um, stress that can generate from any of these um, of these examples. Um, to me, it's important to look at um, communicating clearly. Um, be it on the arrangements, on how um, the structure and the organization of the of the subcluster is is being adapted. Um, it's also about um, mobility and security threats, especially in acute emergencies. Um, when an acute emergency hits, like Cyclone Idai in 2019 in Zimbabwe, um, there is very little time and everybody is running around and it's important to, to really make sure that communication flow is maintained in a way or the other, and also to manage fake news, uh, because this will also happen. 
Um, we had Cyclone Idai, and then one year after, uh, December, last December, we also had threats of additional storms. And all of a sudden, there were videos being cir circulated about the previous cyclone, which was really bad. And those storms were not that bad, but still people started speculating on that. And it was, you know, it was very risky. And it was also impacting on the stress levels of people who had lived Cyclone Idai the year before. So it's important to prevent, to always maintain communication and, um, and clear um, you know, interaction with the partners. Um, it's important for you as a coordinator to have that special eye to pick if, if there is um, any stress across the partners. And the way you do it to me is really personal, but um, it can be um, about not being responsive anymore not attending meetings as before, or um, on the contrary, uh, you might start picking partners frantically asking for requests um, on how do I adapt this service response because I really need to act quick and I have no idea or my brain is, you know, is, um, is not working with me now. So it is the responsibility of the coordinator, well, not the responsibility, but really one of those soft skills to also understand uh, what's going on um, at the stress level of partners during acute emergencies. Um, in terms of practical examples that I was thinking of on how to support um, the cluster partners with, uh, with um, mental health and psychosocial support, um, for instance, during Cyclone Idai, we, we did organize um, some sessions uh, on MHPSS. Actually, it was specific on trauma and bereavement, um, bereavement sessions for frontline workers. Um, this is because, so we worked with the Africa University uh, and some specialized PSS staff in the, in the province that was really badly hit by Cyclone Idai. Um, because again, those were frontline workers who at the same time had their houses flooded away, had their relatives been either hurt or, or dead because of, because of the cyclone, and still they were there working for others. So um, this was an example of supporting them with um, more dedicated staff, mental health and psychosocial support. Um, during COVID, uh, we also had a few sessions, well, in that case, it was webinar series where we engaged um, specialized counselors um, and, um, and specialized personnel to support directly um, frontline workers, including GBV actors. Um, and we set up um, among the many hotlines that we set up also for GBV survivors, we set up a dedicated hotline um, that would assist directly GBV partners with their own uh, mental health and psychosocial support. Um, so um, yeah, this was specifically during COVID because again, they were going through a lot of extra work and the number of GBV cases had escalated fourfold. Um, and um, they were also going through stigmatization because there was the issue about essential service providers being the carrier of the COVID virus. So they were trying the best to provide services while also uh, struggling with all the stigmatization and overload. Um, so the dedicated hotline worked um, as a good practice to, to make sure once they were done with their shift, they could be, uh, they could be moving from being service providers to be um, clients or patients themselves. Um, one last point is about including partners' well-being um, in the agenda for the for the subcluster meetings. Um, again, having meetings as a mechanical thing um, is not always um, the best. You always have to make sure to include a little bit of empathy for partners in there. Um, and again, during COVID, um, it really felt for many partners and for myself as well as a very, um, very good uh, added value to, to work as a team in the, in the subcluster. Um, during the most acute phase, I remember uh, I will go for some days um, and around 4 or 5 p.m. I will have my stomach making some weird sounds and I'll be wondering what is going on. And then I'll realize I didn't eat anything for the whole day. So 
it happens to coordinators as well. I'm sure it happened to all of us. Um, it is really important um, to keep an eye on ourselves and to create that, you know, that well-being of, 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 of service providers um, little corner where we can drop our hats for a minute of service providers and take a little care of ourselves. Um, even little things like starting emails with I hope you're well and safe or ending the, the meeting saying I hope you, you don't forget to eat today or you get some good food before you go to sleep. There are little kindness um, actions that, that make a difference and, and play a good role in, in taking care of, of mental health and psychosocial support for ourselves. So I'll pause it here. And uh, yeah, just to conclude with, uh, with the same that uh, Noemi and Farid already mentioned, empathy and a big heart um, are really um, among those soft skills that a GBB coordinator needs to have. Thank you. Over. Uh, so kind, kindness, we save the world. <laughs> with uh, one of the most important skills for coordinators. We added that today, I think. So thank you very much, Farid and Verena. We have 15 minutes, so I think that we need to give the floor to the, uh, to the students if they have any question for you. or They can also have for Silvia, because this session is very connected to what we had this morning. So I give the power to the room if there are questions and um, and issues in the room that we need to respond in the last 15 minutes of our day on coordination. So the first question, if I will understand, was about uh, how to support uh, the partners who have not yet the aligning capacity, so how to bring them. And the second one was on sustainability. When you have the challenge, how do, how do you deal with the challenges that you can have in building ownership of sustainability when you don't have enough commitment and similar situation? Who wants what? Pick one. Farid, you are mute. I can pick any of the two, Farid. You can, you can choose men first. <laughs> Farid, we can't hear you again. So, Verena, you need to start. Okay, so I'll start. Um, yeah. I'll take the one on how to support partners, maybe when they have just started and they're not um, very clear, maybe how to join the cluster. Was that the question? Yeah. So um, I think I mentioned a few examples from the Zimbabwe context. The Zimbabwe context, for instance, has always been more of a development context that all of a sudden shifted to humanitarian, or it's more of a cyclical um, kind of environment. So yes, some partners might not have the technical skills, um, or they might have different levels of technical skills on how to do GBV in emergencies, right? So um, you just work with what you have. Um, you assess which partners can deliver more on humanitarian response, for instance, and how they can support each other. And also one of the um, cases is that the same partner uh, might not have the same capacity in different geographic locations. So it's also good to do that type of support. Um, if you identify some partners that are strong in some districts or provinces, I don't know the administrative divisions in Nigeria, um, you find a way to build the capacity of the other partners or the other district or province this, um, teams with the support from the ones that have a bit more of, of, of capacity. Um, so this applies to NGOs, international NGOs, to government structures. Um, so it's really like a step-by-step -step process. Um, we all have to start from somewhere. And so you can, you can work with what you have on the ground to build the capacity. And eventually you have a very strong team of GBV partners after a few years. So maybe this is what I would share for this. Over. Mm. I think you're waiting for me to uh, <laughs> write, okay. Maybe to just, uh, just to add with what uh, Verena shared. Um, what you may consider doing colleagues is and, and we hope and pray and wish, you know, that you become uh, our, our colleagues, uh, you know, in, in, in our collective work. 
hopefully soon, inshallah. Um, is is the capacity building plan, the capacity, you know, building plan integrated with the GBV work plan? That's something that you would do. Recently, uh, what we did was, and it's about a month ago, we conducted this capacity needs uh, assessment survey with uh, um, our GBV subclusters partners, engaging GBV subcluster partners at the national level as well as at the uh, governorate level. Um, some 59 organizations took part. And what, um, what we're asking them is to identify key areas um, in terms of Farid, you have you have left us again. It's funny because you get you talk very clearly and then you got mute. No. <laughs> so maybe Verena, you, you want to say something about sustainability and then Farid is back and then we close. And if he's not able to join back, Sylvia will uh, will uh, will close from that. Oh no, he's back. Okay. Roy, I hope uh, I hope this time the internet connectivity yeah. doesn't stand between you... me and uh, our, our very dear colleagues. You have um, one minute left. All right. Okay. So what I would uh, suggest, like uh, you know, uh, get to know the capacity of the partners on the ground through some capacity building. Uh, you know, um, plan that could be integrated into the GBV work plan as well. In relation to sustainability, you see, uh, colleagues, we are consistently inconsistent with our work and could become predictably unpredictable in our work as well. Not knowing what is, what is, what is the need on the ground, um, not knowing, you know, how best we can engage uh, the key government partners, but also the, uh, the, 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 the community-based organizations and women-led organizations. We think that um, the ultimate mantra to addressing gender-based violence is through IPs that we can have on, on the ground and they will implement, they'll distribute dignity kits, will provide psychosocial support and then um, in six, seven months time, the issue will be resolved. It doesn't work this way. I mean, you have to invest in uh, the communities in order again to take the initiative and leadership and ownership of the communities. Uh, if you come up with this idea that the work that you do is a very informed intervention uh, and give them a sense to the affected population in the community that it's not an intrusion, but an informed intervention in which they're the equal partners, um, you get good results. Uh, if you um, start implementing your work without engaging them, the... Uh, the, the results could be very drastic in certain cases. So uh, in terms of sustainability, I mean, start thinking about who could be the real stakeholders, how you may engage them. In certain cases, I have heard from colleagues that now nah, you cannot engage those key traditional leadership. I mean, if you see them the part of the problem, they certainly could be part of the solution as well. Through those key skills as well that we discussed, conflict mitigation, conflict management, negotiation, diplomacy, humanitarian diplomacy. Um, so, so those need to come into play. Yes, completely very true. And so I will only add that to build a strong sustainability, you really, you really need to uh, map all the stakeholders that start with them since the beginning. Because I, if you exclude someone, even the one who are the complicated one, Maybe you are not including here in, in, you, them in your specific meeting, you know, but you are including them in the discussion since the beginning. Otherwise, you will get a lot of conflict and a lot of difficulties because our sector's work is, is very complicated. It is right. something that has still a lot of barriers everywhere in the world. And in emergency, just more complicated. So. Anyway, uh, I think that Verena wants to say a very last word. That's the last, last, last. And then we we'll give back the floor to the colleagues in the room because we are getting over time. Yeah, no, just to agree with you guys on, on sustainability, um, my, my last word would be find your allies. It can be the government, it can be 
the partners, it can be the donors, it can be the media. It really depends with context, but um, find your allies and run with it. Very well. Cool. So kindness and allies, that's the two words today, <laughs> and collaborative leadership. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Silvia, Matthew, over to you. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Farid. Thank you, Mervina. Thank you. Uh, 